Hello St Simons and really warm welcome to our Palm Sunday service, the start of the Holy Week. And of course we can't gather together as a large crowd at the moment, but we are gathered together as a church family, thanks to technology. And we can trust in the presence of our Lord Jesus, who has promised to be with us always. And we can come to worship our Father God, who has promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. And in a moment, Marta and Yanis are going to bring us to our reading, followed by Cameron's talk, and Sonia will lead us in prayer. So shall we just pause and give this time to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we trust in your unfailing love for us, and we ask that we, you, we would hear your voice today and be affirmed in the hope that we have in you, and that we would find our security in you ever deeper. Amen. Today's reading is from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethage at the Mountain of Olives. There Jesus sent two of the disciples on ahead with these instructions. Go to the village there ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied up with her colt beside her. Untie them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything, tell him, the master needs them and then he will let them go at once. This happened in order to make what the prophet had said come true. Tell the city of Zion, look, your king is coming for you. He is, he is humble and rides on a donkey and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey and the colt, threw their cloaks over them and Jesus got on. A large crowd of people spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout, Praise to David's son. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? the people asked. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee, the crowd answered. This week we've applauded again our NHS and all frontline workers. I was out for my daily exercise with one of my sons who was skateboarding ahead of me. We didn't get back for 8pm. Instead, we witnessed cheering and clapping crowds as we walked down Rockley Road for St Simons's. We were making sure to clap with all our might ourselves as we heard all the rich reverberations from the interlinking streets around. Someone just ahead of me couldn't quite resist taking a bow at one point during all this. Today's reading describes the cheering crowds who received Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus' following had swelled very recently in Matthew, Mark and Luke's accounts of the story. They record that he just healed two blind men in Jericho and so crowds were following him. In John's account just before this he mentions the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Many had turned out to see both of them. Huge interest was stirred and Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey and there was a crowd there described as great. But it wasn't all the story. In November 1963 in Dallas, Texas, we know that cheering crowds lined the streets to catch a glimpse of John F. Kennedy's motorcade, the President of the United States. But that wasn't all the story on that day either. Jesus had enemies. He arrived in humility on a donkey into the city, but in just a few days he would leave as a rejected criminal, whipped, tortured, led away to be crucified just outside a city wall. Matthew's scholarly work in setting the scene for the week of the crucifixion of Jesus is very well laid out. He uses Hebrew scripture, which prophesies the Jewish Messiah. Here it is again. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on the colt, the foal of a donkey. And that's from Zechariah the prophet. And then in Psalm 118, Matthew lifts this quote, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he puts that towards the end of his passage. He also uses the word Hosanna twice. That's from 
Jewish writings as well, and it means save. We can be in no doubt of who Jesus is and what he was coming to do, even if the cheering crowds in that euphoric moment would not have been able to conceive of his most important mission, to die on a cross for the sins of his people, the Jews, and for the covenant of God's forgiveness to be offered to all the nations beyond through the shedding of his son's blood. The closing words from the passage forms a Q&A. The city asks, who is this? The crowds reply, Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Perhaps their answer would have been more glorious, more adulating, if they'd been asked the same question once it had been realised that the cross is the linchpin of history. I've stood in that crowd, not then, not there, not with them, but I've been a part I am a part of a Christian country which pays nominal homage to Jesus and what he's done. But would an outsider look at the UK today and get the impression of a caring society with kind people, devoted to following the ways of the Son of God, who emptied himself of all but love, to quote from the famous old hymn? I'm a part of it. I'm guilty. I'm ashamed. We're all part of it. As we get ready for the strangest Holy Week that most of us could ever recall, culminating in Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Resurrection Day, is it time to celebrate? Maybe it's time to repent. The crowd was excited about Jesus, and that was lovely, but it was short-lived. Where, where were they when Jesus was being falsely sentenced to death? Where were they when those gathered a little later on, called out for his crucifixion. Where were we? Where was I? Where were you when our lives became overrun with materialism, with the desire for comfort, overrun with an acceptance that our faith should be private and not spoken of so that we can have a quiet life and not be troubled? And now it's difficult to speak out for Christianity anywhere else apart from a church without being frowned upon at the very least people don't want to know and yet many of the basic things that we have lived for have gone for the time being at least things we've taken for granted and there could be worse in sight panic buying is one thing but what if the national and international food supply seizes up what if coronavirus overtakes britain to the tune of a hundred thousand or a million of course it might not happen and we pray it won't but will we cry out to god then and say sorry that we weren't in tune with him and we didn't shape our personal values our worth work ethic our leisure pursuits around the tag of being his children and his ambassadors is that what it will take for us to be a repentant people even when things return to so-called normal somehow we've got to face once again the mess we've made with god's earth that he created for us maybe we'll have learned the necessary necessary lessons by then it's time to come to God, our merciful Heavenly Father, through Jesus, and say sorry and change some of our ways. Let me lead you in a prayer. It's one of the versions of the confession set by the Church of England for a service of Holy Communion. After I've done that, why don't we take a few seconds to ask God to lead us in a journey of repentance? The full journey is probably not for right now unless you pause the video for an extremely long time. But it's an experience into which God will happily take us if we make a daily commitment to pray and weave repentance into these prayers. Will you commit to repenting daily as part of your prayers with God? He may lead you through different places in your memory. Things you've done, said, thought, some attitudes you've had over the years. Talk to him about them. If you're honest to him, after a while you'll notice a change in your thinking and your seriousness towards God. Because of Jesus' saving act on the cross, our Heavenly Father's forgiveness is instant, but sometimes you need to go through a longer experience to change your lifestyle pattern as we truly move closer to being the children of God that he wants us to be set free. So here's the prayer, then you can pause for however long you like, and then Sonia will lead us in some wider prayers to end the service. Father eternal, 
giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Good morning. Prayers for Sunday the 5th of April, which is Palm Sunday. First of all, I'm going to read a poem by Michael Rosen, written a decade ago to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the National Health Service. These are the hands that tap your back, test the skin, hold your arm, wheel the bin, change the bulb, fix the drip, pour the jug, replace your hip. These are the hands that fill the bath, mop the floor, flick the switch, soothe the sore, burn the swabs, give us a jab, throw our sharps, design the lab. And these are the hands that stop the leaks, empty the pan, wipe the pipes, carry the can, clamp the veins, make the cast, log the dose, and touch us last. Lord, have mercy upon the nations of this world at this terrible time. We bring before you our world leaders, especially our Prime Minister and members of the government, our Queen and her family, our missionaries all over the world. We pray for our Church of St Simons, our Vicar Cameron, Nina, Sam and us, the congregation. We pray especially for everyone working to overcome this terrible virus, and we pray especially for all those who are part of the medical sector, who put their lives at risk to help others and who find themselves at times faced with awful decisions. We ask, Lord, that you give everyone wisdom, clarity of thought, understanding, and sensitivity at this difficult time. We ask you, Lord, that you help us to pray Prayer is so powerful. God loves to hear us speak to him. It is through prayer that God will speak to us. Lord, there are so many needs in the world today. Things are happening that are frightening and beyond our control. Let us each take a moment to pray for someone who is especially on your heart. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Psalm 121, verses 1 to 2. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not be faint. You are the Lord of healing, comfort, restoration and peace. We thank you that you hold dear those who are hurting, broken and in poverty. We believe that you are at work comforting the grieving and restoring hope to the hopeless. Share with us your unending compassion and love for your people. We pray that you will help everyone working to overcome this unseen enemy. To finish, here are the words of the beautiful 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. 
For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen.